four to five minutes. So that that should help a little bit. Just as a note, everybody, from this point forward, we are being recorded. There's Mr. Zanellis. Thank you. All right, I have nine thirty. Why don't we fire it up? Let's broadcast. All right, so I believe we're streaming now and folks are coming in who registered. I'm gonna give that process a couple of, uh, maybe a minute or so to play out before we get going. Good morning, everybody, and happy Friday, by the way. <laughs> uh, get settled in. Uh, you brought your coffee. I brought mine. Um, and this should be a really uh, fun and interesting discussion. So I think everybody's had about a minute or so to settle in. Uh, Jordan, is uh, all have the registrants been let in? Uh, yes, sir. Fabulous. All right, everybody's with us. So good morning, everybody. Welcome and thanks for joining us this morning uh, for the Virginia Sustainable Scholarship Virtual Forum. Uh, I'm Brandon Butler. I'm the Director of Information Policy at the University of Virginia Library and I'll be moderating the discussion today. I'm going to start with a few technical notes and suggestions. Uh, one is I suggest using speaker view in Zoom. Uh, there's going to be between you know eight and ten panelists at any one time but uh, most of us will just be watching like you so it won't be fun to see us all at the same time. So pick a speaker, pick speaker view and you'll see what you need to see. Um, also closed captioning is available. I want to thank our captioner, uh, Diana. Uh, you can choose closed captioning at the bottom uh, of your Zoom screen if you if that would be helpful to you. Um, also, we are recording uh, the video and a captioned video will be available uh, online from our libraries after this event is over. So, for the last several years, uh, I've been supporting this group of library leaders uh, in this forum uh, as they've worked toward this moment, uh, which is simultaneously coming, I'd say, about a year earlier than a lot of us thought, uh, but probably 20 years after people started noticing something was awry with our journal buying system, right? So we'll say a little more about that in a moment, uh, but first let me introduce everybody else you're seeing on your screen here. Uh, first, we have Carrie Cooper. Uh, Carrie is the Dean of University Libraries at William & Mary. Uh, Bethany Davisky is the Dean of Libraries, Senior Academic Technology Officer and Professor of English at James Madison University. John Unsworth is the University Librarian and Dean of Libraries at the University of Virginia. John Zanellis is Dean of Libraries and University Librarian at George Mason University. Stuart Fraser is Interim University Librarian at Old Dominion University. Teresa Knott is Interim Dean of Libraries and University Librarian at Virginia Commonwealth University. Tyler Walters is Dean of Libraries at Virginia Tech. And I also want to acknowledge John Olmschneider and George Fowler, who led the VCU and ODU libraries, uh, respectively, for the first several years of this group's work and helped lay the foundation for what we're, what we're about to embark on. Um, so I'm going to say a few words up front to help ground the conversation. Uh, what is this group? How did we get here? Uh, and what is the basic issue we're concerned about? Then we'll move into answering some of the most popular questions we saw in your registration. And then finally, we'll try to reserve some time at the end uh, to take questions you ask during the forum using the Q&A button in the Zoom window. It's very likely, uh, almost certain, that we will not get to all of your questions, but rest assured uh, we will keep a record of them uh, and uh, we'll continue to use your input to inform the way we do outreach. 
Um, also, if you're a researcher or any kind of constituent at any of our institutions, we really welcome conversations with you about all these issues uh, after this event. Uh, you can reach out to any of us or anyone at our libraries uh, to set up a time to talk with somebody about this project. So a little background. These seven libraries have been buying journal big deals together uh, at least since 2001. Big deals package together all or substantially all of the journal offerings of a given vendor, making them available for a single lump sum price. Since about the turn of the century, these deals have consumed an increasing portion of library budgets, including ours. Since 2016, when we all signed our last big deal with the vendor Elsevier, we've been preparing for a paradigm shift in our approach to these deals. The writing was on the wall uh, back in 2016. We simply could not meet our mission as libraries in the future if we continue to devote a large and growing portion of our budgets to just a few commercial vendors and their big journal deals. So we've started conversations across our campuses, meeting with our presidents and provosts, uh, deans and department chairs, researchers, grad students and students uh, to build understanding of this kind of broken system we're gonna describe to you today and that we hope to start to change. We've disclosed key information about our budgets, including how much we spend on these big vendor deals uh, and how quickly that number has grown over the years. We've been building capacity in our libraries and collaboratively across them to support ways of accessing this literature uh, without subscriptions. We've gathered a massive data set from multiple sources to help inform our decisions. You'll hear a lot more about all those things uh, as the program unfolds. Our biggest deal by far is with the mega publisher Elsevier. Our current Elsevier contract runs through December 2021, but due to the budget impacts of the COVID crisis, we've asked Elsevier to start working with us now on a new approach. We sent them a letter on Monday and we look forward to starting our conversations with them. Obviously, we can't tell you our bargaining strategy uh, in detail, right? Uh, but we can tell you that the status quo is unacceptable and we can share some of the values that inform us as we seek a new way forward. Uh, we can tell you a little more during this event about how we've prepared ourselves to make a better deal this time than we have in the past. Uh, we're pretty sure our friends in Elsevier are watching this forum uh, or they'll watch it later. Uh, and we hope they'll take away from it that we're prepared uh, and even kind of excited to talk to them about recalibrating a pricing model that we know, you know, their new Elsevier recently compared to throwing a bowl of spaghetti at the wall. <laughs> Uh, so, finally, before we get into questions, uh, I want to acknowledge some guests we've invited to join us. Uh, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, broke up its Elsevier big deal earlier this year, and one of the architects of their strategy, Nerea Lamas, is with us today. Uh, thanks for joining us, Nerea. And the Texas A&M University Library is part of a massive new coalition of Texas librarians and institutions uh, that's currently negotiating with Elsevier. And David Carlson, the Dean of University Libraries at Texas A&M is with us today. So thanks for joining us today, David. I also wanna acknowledge friends in the audience from uh, Florida State University, the University of Missouri, University of Maryland, MIT, and the SUNY system, all of whom have been down this road of reforming their approach to the big journal deals. Uh, to the friends and forebears in the audience, we could add 100 or more libraries, universities, and even uh, entire countries around the world who've said enough is enough. Uh, the old big deal model is broken. They've made this path much easier for us to follow by walking it ahead of us. Uh, so now I'm gonna ask the deans a series of questions based on the questions that you all submitted in your registrations. And the first one is a big one. What are the values that are guiding our decisions about big deals and sustainability of scholarship in the future? And uh, first, I want to ask Carrie Cooper to start that answer. Thank you, Brandon. Um, equitable access is where I'd like to start. It is, um, it is consistent with the ethos of librarianship. Um, as public institutions, it is our responsibility to make sure that the scholarship that's produced by our faculty and staff is accessible and that it can have the most impact. Um, access to knowledge improves and saves lives. And paywalls are a barrier to that access and high paywalls are a barrier to that access. Um, one great example is the community's response to COVID-19 in the spring when all of our students were sent home, our libraries were locked up, 
and we saw our research community come together and um, bring down those walls and it was quite remarkable and so we should learn from this crisis and make equitable access the norm. Thanks, Carrie. And so, uh, John Unsworth, I want I wonder if you could say a little bit more about uh, another value that's driving us here. Yep, sorry, just unmuting myself, the thing we all forget to do. Um, I want to begin uh, by talking about diversity in our collections and in scholarly publishing. And I'd like to just briefly share a screen here to help illustrate a point. So this is a blog post from 2012 by Dan Cohen, my counterpart at Northeastern, illustrating what he later comes to call the Wilkins profile. This profile is a library specific graph that shows how many titles in a library's collection are held only by that library, only by a few libraries, by many libraries, etc. In this visualization, a left-leaning library is one with many unique holdings. Some of you will be familiar with this idea of John Wilkins or with Dan Cohen's post about it. There are many nuances to the data, but my point in presenting these visualizations is to say that in general, faculty value uniqueness. Of course, they want what everyone else has, but what should distinguish their own library's collection is that it is uniquely attuned to their interests and indeed reflects the history of those interests over time. As with special collections, what draws researchers to one library rather than another will increasingly in an open access future be those things that are uniquely available in a particular collection. Unless you think that this is uh, a notion only for the likes of Harvard, I want to present one other screen share just briefly. So uh, this is a slide from a presentation by the project manager for the Eastern Academic Scholars Trust, a Mellon funded monograph retention consortium that I helped to set up when I was university librarian at Brandeis and part of the Boston Library Consortium. The part of this slide that I wanted to draw your attention to is the line that says, across this group of 47 small colleges and university libraries whose circulating monograph collections totaled altogether about 60 million volumes, which was about the size of Harvard's collection at the time, 50% of title sets were held by only one library. A title set here means any edition of a title, any manifestation of Moby Dick in pervert terms. Now, I know that I'm talking about monographs and not journals here, but I'm also talking about how collections take shape when they are developed by librarians in collaboration with faculty rather than designed by publishers. Also, I'm a humanist and I'm librarian for the whole university. So my library's collection practices have to serve the book people as well as the journal people. And frankly, journal prices have driven our monograph purchases to the margin. I'm gonna stop sharing. Which is to say, journal publishers are dictating our monograph collecting practices now simply because what we've continued to agree to buy from them is so expensive. We need to stop outsourcing our collection development. We need to take our approval plans off autopilot. We need to reconnect with our faculty and be sure that we're building the collections that they and their graduate students want and need. Faculty don't want their libraries to be McDonald's drive throughs where the menu is the same everywhere. They want libraries that have unique holdings that reflect the intellectual heritage of the departments, centers, institutes, professional schools, and colleges that make up that particular university. How do we know that? Because even in small libraries like those of East who didn't plan together in any way until East, it was clear that before the distorting influence of the big deal hit their library budgets, their collection development had been surprisingly left-leaning in John Wilkins' terms. In the Virginia context, all of our campuses support diverse research interests. ODU has the state's first library school. Virginia Tech has great depth on the bench in engineering. William & Mary has oceanography. VCU and UVA have hospital and medical education programs. JMU is becoming a PhD granting institution. George Mason was recently ranked number one in cybersecurity talent and is tops in criminology as well. These seven campuses don't have a single shared profile of faculty interest, educational emphasis, or research focus. We do have a core set of journals that we all need, but that's a few hundred titles, much smaller than the bundle of thousands of journal titles to which we've been subscribing. 
We're obliged too, to ensure that no single vendor or small group of vendors becomes entitled to so much of our budgets that we can not effectively serve our campus's diverse and emerging needs. New centers, institutes, and other innovative interdisciplinary initiatives need and should have access to the resources that power their work. Not only are our profiles different from one another, they're different over time. New majors and graduate programs arise every year, and while some are variants on a theme already covered in our collecting practices, some are genuinely new areas of interest, and we need the flexibility to adjust our subscriptions to respond to and reflect these ongoing changes in our faculty's research and teaching. In short, we want the structure of our next deal to acknowledge and support our local collection development priorities and support our faculty when they explore new areas rather than having our collections selected and bulk priced by our vendors. Supporting small publishers is also a specific goal of the larger Viva Consortium, which I have the honor to serve as chair of the steering committee this year. Small publishers of all sorts provide an opportunity for new voices and special expertise, and they are often society publishers about which I'll have more to say later. Thank you. Thanks, John. And so finally, uh, last but very far from least, Bethany, I wonder if you would add a third value to the list of things that we have on our minds as we make this uh, transition. Sure, I'd be happy to, Brandon, and good morning, everybody. So um, another of our guiding principles is that costs associated with access to our own collective scholarly work should be, and I will use a very mild word here, these costs should simply be reasonable. And one consequence of having allowed a monopolistic system to develop around commercially licensed journal bundles is that the dollar values that our vendors are assigning to these bundles have truly lost touch with reality. Um, not only has price inflation radically outstripped our own annual budget increases in libraries for decades, the price of the bundles no longer has any real relationship to the vendor's actual cost to produce these digital journals, nor does it correspond to any fundamental extra value that the vendor itself adds to the work of our faculty who produce this scholarship. The value of scholarly journals comes almost entirely from the labor provided by authors and researchers themselves, and then by volunteer faculty peer reviewers and editors who offer their time and their work to the system too. And, um, and that's a little hard to take when you learn about the truly intolerable profit margins that private companies are extracting for their shareholders from our cash strapped public uh, institutions. So these are 30 to 40% profit margins for top vendors. And that dwarfs what investors make from companies like Apple or Google. Um, the vendors that we're talking about today have absolute revenues in the billions of dollars. Um, they've got profits that exceed the annual budgets of major research funders like the Howard Hughes Medical Institute or the Wellcome Trust. Um, bundled big deals are, um, they're, they're just not good deals too. So it's like with cable TV where you might only wanna watch a couple of channels, but Comcast makes you subscribe to 150 of them. Librarians know how to, how to crunch our own data and our data shows that these big bundles are chock full of titles that our researchers never ever use. So I'm not talking about journal issues, mind you, I'm talking about whole, whole titles, whole journal titles that we have to pay for and that nobody on campus actually really wants. The, um, the value of these bundles is also in decline due to the growth in open access, that is the free and legal sharing of scholarly preprints and so forth. More and more of what we are paying for is available for free outside the paywall. And we've got really good systems for helping scholars to locate those versions and for resource sharing across institutions. So, you know, overall, Elsevier and similar companies, um, they, they do see the writing on the wall. They know that this model is coming to an end and therefore they're also putting us in a position to have to reject some double dipping that they're doing. That is when faculty authors pay fees to have um, the work that they place in subscription journals made open access, our prices for that same journal can't continue to go up. Uh, that's just simply not fair. 
Our, our colleagues in the UK have recently issued a public statement calling for a 25% price reduction on big deals, explaining that this is a long overdue recalibration and that demand or a little better plus um, an effort to make sure that we're really wanting what we're paying for. All that sounds about right to us. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Bethany. And so um, the next thing uh, question that came through was about uh, how we decide which journals are valuable and if we have to make cuts or make a custom bundle, how will we decide what to keep and what to cut? And I wonder, uh, Tyler Walters from Virginia Tech, if you could answer, say a little bit about that question. Yeah, thanks, Brandon. I can definitely reply to that. So first, I'd just like to say that the data that we're working with, the data that we have now in 2020, is just so much more rich and informative than the data we were working with in 2016 when we signed our current deal for the Freedom Collection. We have data sources from products and services like OneFigure, Unsub, uh, Counter5 Reports, uh, and Green Glass, and, and other, other resources as well. So when we think about what is a subscription, just to ask that basic question, uh, we know that there's really, this is, well, it's very familiar to us all, but it's really just one way of providing access. And for low use titles, to pay as much as we are to have something ready, online, available to get at at any time, when it's barely, if never used, is just an extremely expensive way to go about doing it. So how do we know a journal is worth our while? Of course, we look at article downloads and the numbers or, or amount of downloads. We all know that. Uh, but what does that really tell us? It, it tells us somebody downloaded an article that we don't know really what anybody's doing with the articles with that. So we do look at other factors such as uh, citation rates for articles in a given journal. And we put a lot of weight on that. That's telling us that there are scholars out there that are using those works in their own work. We also look uh, quite a bit at our own researchers and where they publish, where, where are the venues of the journal venues that they uh, really enjoy and see are important to their own work. Um, back on downloads for a moment, you know, we do look at things in a more finely grained way now as well. We look at, you know, are the downloads from recent issues? Or are they from um, older back file packages? That might inform how we provide access to, to the current literature. Um, another factor we work with our faculty on is, is to understand uh, the preponderance of instant access that's needed from a given journal, or can people wait a day? And that too might tell us something about how we provide access to it. And another panelist is going to talk more about these modes of access, so we'll, we'll get into that a little bit, a little bit later. Um, but I do want to reiterate what, what Bethany said, is that, you know, the data is absolutely telling us 100% that we have hundreds of journals that are not read or barely read. To give you a quick data point from Virginia Tech, out of this Freedom Collection package, there are about 40% of the journal titles get 50 downloads per year. So that means on average, there's 40% there's of these journals get a download per week from our entire university community. That's all the students, all the faculty, all the staff. So that is barely being used. And we just don't wanna pay this rate for it anymore. I should mention too that there's a lot of qualitative uh, input on this. Of course, we do talk with faculty who are, who are interested and willing to work with us on understanding uh, journal publishing, journal the, the literature in their fields, and uh, which, which titles they really are covet and are important to them. Uh, so maybe let me go back to the very beginning of the question for just a moment, because the question was, how are we going to pick titles? And I know people want to know, well, how many titles do we think we're going to end up with? And, and I, I just honestly can't answer that because we just don't really know how many titles in the end we're going to have. Um, but I would say, you know, the work that we've done here is, is we think we can provide about three quarters of our usage online for a, a far smaller cost. And we feel confident, I think, as a consortium, as a partnership here, that, that we can do that. We can, we can still provide a good bit, a majority of online access for a much smaller cost. Great, thanks, Tyler. And that leads very directly to our next question, which is, uh, if it turns out that negotiations uh, play out uh, in such a way that some titles are no longer part of our subscription bundle for any particular deal, 
um, what are some of the ways that folks can access content after a subscription is canceled? And I want to ask Stuart Fraser uh, to say a little bit about that. Thanks, Brendan. Um, I think one of the really important takeaways um, I hope people uh, get from the forum today is that uh, su subscriptions are now, as Tyler uh, touched upon, uh, only one of several uh, lawful uh, means to access uh, scholarly uh, materials, scholarly content from Elsevier uh, and from others. Um, we are committed uh, as a group and each of our indiv individual libraries to continuing to meet the research needs of uh, faculty uh, and students at our institutions um, using uh, a more flexible array of uh, methods. Um, and uh, we believe strongly that uh, through that process, we will achieve um, a more cost-effective uh, operations. Um, so among these methods uh, of access, uh, for one thing, um, many of the contracts uh, that we have um, engaged in with uh, vendors of uh, scholarly content like Elsevier include perpetual access. And so what that means is that uh, content uh, that we purchased online access to um, is and will remain accessible to us uh, even after our existing contract expires. Uh, so in a lot of those cases, what would be uh, affected by a, uh, a, a loss of uh, subscription access would be uh, access to new materials. It would not necessarily uh, have an impact on access to um, to backfile to older materials. And that varies from contract to contract. So in each case, there would be some variation. But um, uh, in many cases, there would be perpetual access to uh, material that we licensed, purchased in the past. Uh, the second means of access, which I know many uh, of the faculty um, who may be attending and others are well familiar with is interlibrary loan. <clears throat> Basically, interlibrary loan is a resource, uh, long-standing resource sharing process with very mature partnerships um, uh, and, uh, and an increasingly um, uh, innovative and robust uh, backbone that allows libraries to share material with one another. Um, and it was created really to uh, meet the needs uh, of uh, libraries to have access uh, to um, our, uh, scholarship that is published in journals that are not widely um, needed at their institution, but are occasionally needed. So basically, uh, resource sharing through interlibrary loan was designed as a way uh, for libraries to share uh, those li libraries with subscriptions to uh, journals that are essential to programs that they're offering can share with other libraries that may not have programs that would require or demand uh, lead to them uh, subscribing to those journals. Um, Viva and our libraries in VRL um, are uh, implementing a variety of expedited interlibrary loan processes. Um, Rapid ILL is an example of one that Viva is uh, working on a group uh, license for. And uh, these have sped up the uh, turnaround time on interlibrary loan uh, significantly. In many cases now, interlibrary loan uh, systems allow for a turnaround time of under 24 hours. Um, and so that is another important um, uh, lawful way to acquire content um, in the event that subscriptions uh, are no longer in place. And then the final piece of this puzzle, uh, well, there are actually two, I jumped ahead a little bit. The next piece is open access. And um, these are the platforms that uh, many of the institutions, I think all of the VRL institutions have them, and Viva is also looking at some things across the board for all the institutions uh, in Virginia. Uh, repositories are uh, locations where uh, either uh, working papers, preprint pre 
versions, or if the publisher allows, final versions um, of uh, scholarly content can be hosted and made accessible um, at no charge uh, to uh, uh, usually without restriction. So uh, that is a, a third means. And then the final means uh, is uh, what uh, it amounts to pay-per-view or on-demand purchasing directly from publishers or through third-party vendors that work with publishers uh, and to purchase uh, scholarship uh, journal articles, for example, at the article level. So in the absence of a subscription, uh, we still would be uh, able and committed to, if needed, purchasing directly at the article level from the publisher or one of these third parties, which includes uh, the most notable example, Reprints Desk is one, and uh, Copyright Clearance Center's Get It Now service is another. Those are platforms through which you can purchase articles um, with the copyright clearances already included um, in the purchase cost and then deliver those articles directly into the hands of researchers. So uh, in sum, it's important to understand once again that uh, uh, subscriptions are only one of many uh, ways that we can now provide scholarly content quickly and efficiently to researchers um, and that we're all, all collectively and individually committed uh, to doing that at uh, the highest possible level. Excellent. Thanks so much, Stuart. Um, yeah, I think this is one of the most important points uh, that we try to make when we talk about these issues, you know, that uh, uh, the changes that we're looking at are not changes that take access away. They're changes that make access available through different channels. And sometimes that changes who you go to for access or, you know, it adds a little bit of time, uh, but, um, but there's no world where things disappear forever. We're committed to making resources available to the folks that need them. So my next question is for Bethany. And it is, uh, how does this effort by this group of libraries relate to, uh, relate to the incentive structures created by promotion and tenure policies? Um, how does our effort to change the landscape, uh, how are we impacted by those policies? Yeah, okay. Well, the first thing to say here is that this is a highly complex ecosystem in which we are all intertwingled. And the, the push for change that you hear coming from your, your university libraries um, is just one part of what is needed. And that's really why we're talking with you today with, with our faculty. Um, we're doing what we can along with our library colleagues around the world. And that includes uh, sharing our knowledge about why these models are unsustainable for us all. In libraries, we are trying our hardest to limit our investments in broken models, and we are investing in what we see as viable, sustainable alternatives. Um, and those include institutional repositories, they include preprint platforms, other open infrastructures and aligned services that are designed by scholars for scholars. So, so that, that's important to say first. But but we need your help because that only gets us so far. So without reform to the entire system, research is going to continue to flow behind paywalls or into OA journals that have sky high article processing fees. And that reform that is needed really has its roots in what you all as scholars and researchers value in where you choose to push, where you place your energies and your gifts and where you put the products of your labor. It's, it's about how you shape the future of your own disciplines. And of course, one tool for doing that is um, addressing through your professional associations and locally at the academic department level, the expression of your discipline's values that takes the form of promotion and tenure guidelines. Um, that is uh, what you're telling the next generation of scholars in your field fundamentally matters and where you tell them that you wanna see their work appear. Um, so the most important consideration and reform I might suggest is to uh, look at removing journal-based metrics from research evaluation. 
Uh, and that's not just good for promoting a more sustainable economy around scholarly communication. I think it's good for scholarship itself. And this really came home to me earlier in my career. I was, um, I was sort of making a tour of Australian universities that were doing interesting work in the digital humanities and they were wanting to create a new professional association and a new interdisciplinary open access journal so that they could network and broaden and build um, a really interdisciplinary field. But a kind of a research assessment exercise had just been instituted there at the national level in which journals had assigned impact factors to them. So they had numerical scores. And everybody there in the middle of all of this intellectual foment was also kind of fundamentally downhearted because how could you create a new journal? How could you create a new field when it would come into the picture with an impact factor of zero? And the feeling was that all the scholarly creativity and interchange across the humanities and engineering and social science and everything else was about to hit the brick wall of an ossified set of top journals that were really not welcoming of the new. So anyway, so on, on reconsidering journal-based metrics, um, models and principles already exist. You don't have to reinvent the wheel here. So I would suggest looking at things like the Leiden Manifesto or SF Dora, the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment. But my big takeaway here is that the, the system can't change. Our research fields, our scholarly disciplines will be slower to evolve, to advance, to open themselves up to completely new ideas and scholarly insights, as long as a few journal titles, notably the titles that are least accessible to broad publics and to less well-funded institutions, as long as those are the ones that hold the keys for faculty to career success. And all the power to address that lies in the hands of our faculty. And we wanna be partnering with and serving you um, and enabling you to realize um, your own power for change. Thank you, Bethany. Wow, a powerful story. Um, and so that's a great story about how, you know, libraries are enmeshed in a system that, that can uh, change the way we have to operate. But of course, when libraries change the way we operate, uh, that'll have ripple effects uh, uh, among the rest of the ecosystem. And so, John Unsworth, I wanted to ask you, you know, what do we anticipate could be the impact of our uh, sort of move toward a more sustainable model on maybe smaller publishers, scholar, scholarly society journals, and so on? Are, are we going to endanger those uh, folks by uh, rethinking our approach to uh, big deal bundles? It's a very reasonable question. Um, we know that some scholarly societies rely on subscription revenue from big deal partners. Uh, unfortunately, we also know that in the past, big deals have forced us to cancel subscriptions to some independent society journals, ironically driving some of those societies into the arms of big deal publishers. So as libraries rethink our commitments to big deals, we can begin to reverse this process, dedicating more resources to sustaining independent publications that are scholar led and that support the research community rather than supporting a commercial entity. Uh, the open scholarship community, which includes libraries and research funders, is creating support systems for journal editors, societies, etc., who want to pivot to more sustainable models. Several of the libraries in this Virginia Research Libraries group and many others across the country provide publishing services that can help bring journals to the public at a fraction of the cost associated with commercial publishers. And if you haven't looked at it, I recommend the Library Publishing Coalition's directory at librarypublishing.org. If you're a journal editor or an officer in a society, talk to your library about how you can partner to advance some important shared goals. We really do want to help you with infrastructure that can support a peer review process and allow you to publish in multiple formats with clear rights statements that preserve intellectual property while promoting new research. If you publish open access, your work is 20% more likely to be cited. Of course, if you publish something stupid, that'll get 20% more attention as well. Um, I do want to say a word to small scholarly publishers in particular, though, based on my experience with two pretty small scholarly publishing enterprises. Uh, the first is the Text Encoding Initiative. This is a tremendously important multidisciplinary, international, and by now multi-generational effort to develop a detailed and actionable ontology of literary 
and linguistic texts. Its core publications is a set of guidelines for text encoding now in XML. The TEI has existed since the late 1980s, and when I incorporated, incorporated it as a nonprofit membership organization in 2000, it was a very important question whether or not to charge for access to the TEI guidelines. We chose to do so only for print and then at cost and in partnership with the University of Virginia Press. The result was a broader adoption of the standard, growth in the community of research users and contributors, greater internationalization and more multilingualism, open access peer reviewed journals published with support from the TEI, training materials just now redeveloped and re-released, in short, a vibrant intellectual community that is not dependent on journal income. My second example though is a more traditional scholarly society that was when I joined it, entirely dependent on journal income, or more accurately indentured to their commercial publisher, such that we collected subscription income from members of the society and then passed it along to them, keeping about 10% for the operation of the society. I ditched that deal and worked with Harold Short and then Ray Siemens to lay the foundation of what became the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations, which also has a publishing deal at its heart. And it's a much better deal with an academic publisher, albeit a large and commercially successful one, where they share income appropriately with the society that creates the value for which institutions and individuals subscribe. That income has allowed ADHO to support the Open Access Digital Humanities Quarterly, as well as funding generous bursaries for graduate students presenting at the annual conference. And largely thanks to Harold Short's brilliance at sharing, we've been able to use the income to ADHO as a platform for expanding the organization to new countries and new research communities. So what, what was once a bilateral US organization partnered with an EU organization has become a network of scholarly societies, not only in those areas, but also in Mexico, Taiwan, Japan, South Africa, Australasia, and Francophone countries with more constituent organizations under consideration for membership each year. My message, my message to small publishers is this, value sharing and collaboration over outsourced services and opaque accounting. Own the thing you produce and then figure out how in your particular situation you can best sustain and share that value through some combination of things that people or institutions pay for and things that are free. Don't assume that your most valuable asset should be the one people pay for. Also think about how giving away your thing of value might attract the contribution of talent and ideas helping to create a sustainable scholarly community. Thank you, John. Again, great, great stories um, and really making this stuff real for folks. Um, so uh, speaking of things that are real, uh, I want to get to the moment that we're in right now. Uh, we are being, uh, frankly, uh, forced to act with some urgency now by the budget crisis that's uh, resulting from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And a lot of folks were wondering, you know, how exactly does what we're doing now relate to the COVID crisis? And what, you know, well, is this, is what we're doing now sort of a temporary thing that's a, a reaction to the budget crisis, or is it going to have longer term effects on the way we operate? And I wanted to ask John Zanellis from George Mason University to talk a little bit about how COVID relates to what we're doing. Thank you, Braden. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to start by uh, observing that uh, to one degree or another uh, at most academic institutions, library budgets uh, have been declining or otherwise constrained prior to the onset of the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, that was certainly the case at my university. The pandemic has brought on additional budget pressures on our universities which has necessitated broad and deep budget uh, cuts, uh, which likely, uh, highly likely, uh, will continue and not recover uh, well into the for foreseeable future. So we have transitioned uh, at this point in time from a generally not so good into a horrible, uh, severe um, fiscal environment. Uh, in such fiscal realities, uh, uh, we're compelled uh, to restructure and rebalance our budgets. And that includes uh, library budgets. Uh, this is uh, what drives us at our individual institutions and also collectively to take urgent action. Simply put, 
academic library financial models uh, that made uh, good sense some time ago, at least in some institutional settings, are no longer tenable uh, nor uh, sustainable. Big deals occupy a significant footprint on uh, our collections budgets. In George Mason University's case, uh, it is roughly one third of our current uh, library uh, research materials budget. But I think the financial, uh, uh, the, the impacts of uh, the pandemic uh, on, on our finances and, and, and all the effects of that uh, just accelerate the inevitable collapse of the status quo. Uh, for all the reasons talked about by my colleagues already, we need to make drastic changes to our library collection strategies. And such changes will not be temporary uh, or reversible. Uh, given the current crisis, and in retrospect, it's something uh, we have needed to do for some time. Uh, so what do we do now and going forward? It is important to be strategic in our decision making. We need to do more than just meet immediate spending targets. Some strategies will have commonalities across institutions while other approaches will need to address specific and uh, perhaps unique institutional uh, circumstances and needs. As we uh, discontinue big deals, we need to allocate funds to cover costs for other forms of access. For example, in their library loan and document delivery, commercial article purchases, tools for discovery of open access uh, content uh, and so forth. Based on reports by some institutions, we have already departed uh, big deals. We know the costs for alternative access are more manageable. Uh, even in some cases, uh, they can be characterized uh, as uh, uh, typically uh, modest in, uh, in, in some institutional settings. We need to create capacity as well as scope in our collections budgets to be able to better fund uh, where we expect growth, to redirect funding to areas where we may have uh, unmet needs, and importantly, to invest in more sustainable ways of sharing research um, across our institutions uh, and, and much more broadly. So uh, in concluding uh, my remarks, uh, I would say that we are a, at a point um, where uh, most, if not all of us, are faced with the stark reality of significantly diminished uh, budgets, uh, the demand for scholarly uh, uh, scientific resources and, uh, and associated services are not diminishing, uh, but uh, they are growing uh, in our institutions. So the game plan that worked uh, relatively well uh, for many of us in the past uh, has to be recalibrated and changed to more effectively respond to the current and future challenges. Uh, this is inevitable. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. And um, so <clears throat> the next question I want to ask uh, relates to the way the complicated we've been talking a little bit about how there's a kind of complex ecosystem here um, and what's interesting uh, and maybe fewer of our folks in the audience will know is that each vendor sort of has a complicated ecosystem of products uh, that it sells and I wonder um, Teresa not from VCU if you could help us understand a little bit better how big deals relate to other products in the uh, vendors portfolios and how we're thinking about the consequences of the choices we might have to make um, as they could kind of reverberate throughout uh, that vendor ecosystem. Sure. Thank you, Brandon, and good morning, everyone. So vendors like Elsevier and Wiley have been pivoting to being a data analytics business for some time. They are striving to monetize the insights that they gain into the research that our institutions do 
by their control of the literature. Additionally, they are building products that plug into every step of the research flow. These products are designed to seamlessly integrate with each other and thus entice customers to buy more of their products to leverage the seamless integration. There is a real danger to academic freedom here. Scholarship is, scholarship is shaped by the metrics we use to evaluate scholars. And by controlling metrics, vendors are given an outsized influence on the trajectory of research itself. Often these products are marked, or excuse me, are marketed to different campus units, such as the provost or the office of research. This can undermine our efforts to control the cost for the library for those products that we license. So it's really important that we communicate and coordinate across the university as well as across the Commonwealth. For VCU and other customers, Elsevier links pricing across products and contracts. So we have to be especially careful to anticipate how changes will ripple out. In our particular case, our clinical key contract is linked to the continuation of our current science direct license agreement. Over the last few years, we have asked Clinical Key to align the contracted dates. So the Clinical Key contract would be in sync with Science Direct, and they've refused to do this. From what we can glean from others, this seems to be a common practice. And so I think that they use these different termination dates to put you in this bind of, well, I'm gonna to have to cancel this if the other is in question. So in fact, we are in the process of terminating our clinical key contract at this moment as we move into renegotiating with Elsevier. And one of the most important things about these agreements from my perspective is that they lack transparency. So our clinical key agreement is written in such a way where there's a nebulous increase should we walk away from our science direct contract. So we don't know what the consequences are for us to walk away. And this is representative of other things that happen with other contracts. Thanks, Teresa. So this is a, this is a complex system. This is a really complex system that we're working in. Um, and you know that's part of why it's taken us a while to think through what to do. Um, but we're feeling pretty good about where we are now. And uh, we're also starting to think about the future. And I wanted to ask uh, Carrie Cooper to kind of bring us home here and talk a little bit about what a sustainable future might look like. You know, if we transition away from something uh, that we have lots of problems with, um, what, is, what does the world look like if we, uh, if we find something better? What's a better model gonna bring us to? Thank you, Brandon. I think it's really important to kind of um, imagine what that does look like. It helps us get there just by imagining it. And I think we have to get back to our values, um, equitable access, diverse collections, and fair costs. For example, a future with equitable access would erase the global divide and um, an access to research for both readers and authors. It would demonstrate our commitment to solving big problems um, beyond the higher education community. It would let faculty authors retain their rights and share and reuse their work. It, it would enable text and data mining across all published research. And it would end high author fees that create new barriers to research publication, this time for authors instead of the readers. And a future with diverse collections would better meet the unique needs of our research communities because one size doesn't fit all. It would foster scholar-led initiatives at our institution that brings control back to our scholarly community. And most importantly, it would support independent and underrepresented voices and outlets and approaches. A future with fair costs would end non-disclosure agreements that prevent healthy competition and foster transparency about how prices, how the price of the product relates to the operation of a service. It would end unfair tactics like double dipping where we charge the libraries and we charge the authors. 
and it would lower costs for students with open educational resources. It would help us avoid a bigger deal that would just replace unsustainable subscriptions with unsustainable author fees. So it's really about getting back to our values, equitable access, diverse collections, and fair costs. I hope that helps us imagine what this looks like. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, thanks a lot. And so, yeah, that's the future we're looking toward. And uh, that that sort of concludes the the questions that we heard from the group with uh, the group of registrants with one. A little bonus I wanted to to include. Um, we had a few questions. I know there's a lot of librarians in the audience who were curious about how we're doing this, and you know how are we gonna how are we gonna pull this off? And uh, the good news is. Uh, for us, especially, we're not the first ones to go here, and we're not the only ones to do this right now. And so uh, we really wanted to um, recognize uh, some of the folks that are that have paved the way and who are walking this road with us now. And I wanted to, um, I think we've elevated now David Carlson and Nerea Lamas um, to panelist status. And I wondered if uh, maybe starting with Nerea, um, if, uh, Nerea, if you could tell us a little bit about the University of North Carolina's experience going through this process uh, and, and having concluded a deal with Elsevier that you all are happy with and that now you're, you're working forward on. Yes, thank you, Brandon. Good morning, everyone. I'd be happy to tell you a little bit about our process and, and where we are today with it. So we started our Elsevier negotiation in spring of 2019. And we had a goal of uh, not necessarily breaking the deal, but we needed to spend less. And we decided a million dollars was what we wanted to cut from our spend with Elsevier. And just before we started to talk with them, we decided we needed to do an informational campaign on campus. And so we launched our own sustainable scholarship campaign. Um, and it started with our university librarian. She started doing some presentations. I did them, it went all the way down to our liaisons. We spread it across campus in meetings and departmental settings and one-on-ones in, in uh, administrator meetings. So we really took it far and wide. We went out with four values. We talked about affordability, sustainability, transparency, and open and public access. And we, everyone understands open access, but we needed to add in the public because Carolina is a very public institution and we believe in that public mission. And so we believe that that would resonate well with our campus and, and, it, and it truly did. Um, at the same time that we were talking to campus about sustainable scholarship, which was partly around Elsevier, but it was a, a much broader message that we were trying. Uh, we were trying to contextualize the landscape and trying to say that we could not continue in the same way that we always had with these big deals. And in fact, we had already uh, gone through a process of breaking big deals before. We had broken the Wiley deal a couple of years before I came on board. And so it, this was not an unfamiliar message, but I think it was the first time that we really explained what this meant and why it was not sustainable. So at the same time that we were uh, going out there with our message, talking to Elsevier, we were also not knowing what the outcome would be, investigating how we would take care of scholar needs if we did break this deal and, and canceled many uh, journals. And so we spent a lot of time, like other institutions have, looking at options for ILL, including Reprints Desk, which is a, a vendor who has an automated system. And, and ultimately, we did incorporate Reprints Desk um, into our strategy. Um, I want to I wanna acknowledge uh, ter what Teresa was talking about with Clinical Key. We had the exact same problem. Uh, our clinical key was, was going to be up at the end of September. They ignored uh, our attempts to talk to them and, until they finally got the cancellation message. We said, we are canceling, we no longer need this. We, we cannot go forward if we don't know what the cost will be at, at the end of this negotiation. And they scrambled a little bit, they came back, they tried to get us back. Ultimately, we just canceled. Um, and so that happened before we got to the end of our negotiation with Science Direct with Elsevier. 
And um, so by the time we got to spring of 2020, uh, so it took us a year, more than a year to get to the, to the final point, we uh, had decided we were gonna break the bundle. We were gonna go title by title. We decided to go out and ask the campus about their use of titles. Um, we were concerned about clinical uh, titles and clinical usage in, in our med school, in our hospitals, in our other clinical settings. And so essentially we went out and asked them how they use their titles so that we could focus in on, on those clinical titles. And those became the core of the package or the title list that we have now, I shouldn't say package. We have 395 titles down from the maybe couple thousand that we had to begin with. And our spend uh, for, this, for this year was at 1.6 million. So we brought it down by a million. Um, it was, I will say, a tremendous amount of work. We had many, many people in the library involved, again, from the university librarian down to our liaisons across our tech services. This is, this is an enormous effort that has to go in, but it was well worth it. Um, we have, uh, we talked to so many people on campus that messaged us afterwards and said, thank you for breaking that deal with Elsevier. We are so happy. Can we do that with other publishers? Um, we have real champions now on campus. That's not to say that it's all rosy. There are problems um, with access at, at times for people. That's never going to go away, but by and large, um, we, I think, were successful in doing this. And I just looked at a couple numbers before I came on to the webinar this morning. Uh, just our reprints desk numbers. We were not, didn't know what to expect um, because we offered it out there for people who needed their articles urgently. Out between May and August, out of the 276 articles we have purchased from reprints desk, only 123 are from Elsevier titles. So by and large, the needs are being met through regular interlibrary loan through our historic access. So uh, as mentioned earlier, we have permanent access to back files. So most, most people's uh, needs are being taken care of through regular means. And uh, having the reprints desk is just a, a peace of mind for everyone. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Norea. That's, um, it's just so heartening to know uh, how well your experience turned out, um, but also to take to take note of how hard this can be and how much work it is. Um, but knowing it pays off, I think, especially for those of us on, uh, in the panelist side of things, uh, you know, it, it, it gives us great comfort to know that um, there's life on the other side and that things turn out pretty well. Um, so next I wanted to ask David Carlson, the Dean of Libraries at the Texas A&M University, uh, to say a little bit about where the Texas libraries are. Um, and I know you're in the midst of negotiations and so you'll have to be uh, cagey, but, um, but maybe you could also just say how you got here and um, what the values were that brought you um, to negotiating in a new way this time around than you have in the past. Sure, I, I, don't, I don't wanna think of myself as being cagey, Brandon. I think circumspect would be maybe a, a better word, but you're right, and that was gonna be the first thing I was gonna say. Uh, is that I do need to be circumspect in what I say for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, strategically, of course, we uh, we don't want to in any negotiations process. You don't want to say everything about how you're how you're thinking, what you're doing. But also, I want to respect the negotiations process itself with with Elsevier. So, and let me just also say that I, I'm just so impressed with uh, all the comments by all the speakers. You have no idea. I mean, I've been jotting things down and my head's been shaking up and down in affirmation. Um, all of the values and statements and perspective you've been saying are just uh, really have aligned with uh, what we've been doing. Um, I mean, there's so much to say about this. Uh, and I certainly agree with a lot of the perspectives that have already been said. In terms of how we got here, I think whenever anybody asks me about this, I always have to give a shout out to the University of California. Um, I think the University of California um, position and statement on this and their decisive nature on or decision on this, uh, stand on this, I should say, about a year and a half ago now, getting on to two years, was really, in my opinion, a game changer. 
um, all of a sudden, I, I practically the week that happened, um, all of a sudden I was getting emails uh, and queries from people I'd never heard from before about this issue who would say, well, what are we doing in this space? And they just gave all of us, I think, a kind of a backbone um, to this issue that said exactly what you were saying, Brandon, this, this can be done. Uh, it's not jumping off a cliff. Uh, there is survival uh, for a number of different reasons, many of which you touched upon. And the discussion has also reminded me that when, when we put out the press release about the Texas Coalition, I got a wonderful unsolicited email from Stanley Wilder, Wilder at LSU, who has also done a lot of the same unbundling, significant unbundling that UNC described. And uh, he just, as I say, an, an, an unsolicited email, and he wanted us to take comfort and he told us that the, uh, the decision at UNC was, at, at LSU, excuse me, has, and I quote, a perfect unmitigated success. They have absolutely no regrets and they're moving forward and uh, everything, I won't say everything is well or perfect, but, it, but it's pretty good. Um, there, not only is there survival, uh, it, it's much better than that. Life, life is good. So um, our approach to the business has been in a number of ways. First of all, our coalition is quite different. I'm really very, very proud of it, uh, but it's also very diverse. Um, it includes both public institutions and private institutions. So we have all of the University of Texas libraries, Texas A&M, et cetera, but we also have really some premier um, and leading uh, private libraries, such as uh, Rice University, Baylor University, et cetera. We have some very strong research intensive institutions, and we have some very um, teaching intensive institutions. So it's a very diverse group. One of the things that has really brought us together is that we have all agreed and signed on to a memorandum of understanding about our organization, uh, a little bit of explicit analysis of what our views and values are, and a little briefly about how we are organized. And it was required that that be uh, signed by an upper level administrative person at the university. And that has done I mean, I thought it was a good idea to do this from the beginning for a number of reasons, but it's turned out to be an even better idea uh, than I anticipated because it really got the institution to talk about this commitment formally and seriously, and then to actually put a, put a name and a statement and a signature document that said, yes, we're in on this. So lastly, I'll just, I'll just conclude by saying a few things about, very broadly, about what our approach to negotiations is, which I think will harmonize with a lot of what you said. Um, we are not set on debundling, unbundling, excuse me. We are not set on withdrawal or walking away from negotiations. We are not set on a transformative agreement, but what we are set on is change. We think it's high time for change, substantive change. Um, I remember in one of our early meetings with our Elsevier uh, representatives, they referred to their contract, one of the representatives referred to their contract as Byzantine. Uh, I think this was a, a frank moment, <laughs> uh, and I agree with them 100%. We have contracts that are based on decades old commitments of print subscriptions. I, it, it's, it's absurd, uh, and so that needs to change. And then secondly, the other commitment we have is to price reduction. Um, an additive approach is no longer appropriate and we need to get to price reductions for many of the reasons you've talked about. So I'll wrap up there, but thank you for, for all of this and thank you for the, the time to speak briefly about the Texas after, efforts. Thank you so much, David. Um, circumspect as always uh, and, and, lovely, and lovely to see you as always. Thanks so much for sort of being our guest today um, and you know, I think we probably, uh, we, we are very much aligned with the Texas libraries uh, about what the priorities are and what we're looking for. Um, so that thus ends the uh, planned portion, the scripted portion, if you will, of the program. And now we've got actually a substantial amount of time, which is lovely uh, to hear from your kind of live questions uh, during the forum. And so, um, I've got in front of me here a list of some of those questions. And I wonder if we could start with um, a question for actually, we'll bring in one, perhaps, let's see, let me, we're testing the tech here, but we've got a little time. 
Um, I'm going to ask if Jordan, our tech guru, could bring in Ann Osterman, who is the executive director of Viva, and see if she wants to answer this question about how Viva and the Virtual Library of Virginia uh, represent, uh, figures into all of this stuff. I, I don't Let's see. Let's see. Ann, we're putting you on the spot, if that's okay. <laughs> And we see you, or we, we hear, heard you momentarily. Hmm. All right, well, the joys of live television here. Um, we might then, yes, yeah. John. Yeah, I think I, think I could take this there as the chair of the steering committee for, for Viva. Um, Perfect. There are a number of uh, subscriptions that Viva pays for uh, or contributes to that are extremely important to member libraries. The Elsevier contract is not one of those. Um, and I guess in this context, that's the most important point. And I, I think one reason that it's not uh, a Viva collection is that it's so expensive and uh, that spreading that cost to, say, community colleges uh, in the VIVA system uh, wouldn't really make sense. And that's why the Virginia Research Libraries, a subset of VIVA, uh, have negotiated together in the past for the Elsevier contract and are, are planning to do so again. Uh, we would love to see uh, broader access uh, to some of that content. Um, that will depend on, on price more than anything else. Brandon, could I jump in and add just one more thing here? Unless we've got sure. Anne's audio. All right, seems like maybe not. Uh, the other thing I'd like to add is that we are all part of this rich and vibrant Viva network. And through the resource sharing um, partnerships that stretch all over the Commonwealth of Virginia, we know that what we do as research institutions impact others. And, um, and you know, I'm still relatively new to my role, but I have found the intersection between the VRL partners and Viva to be thoughtful, rich, vibrant. And we, we know that, um, that we're all connected and all in this together. Excellent. Thanks, Bethany. Um, so uh, the next question I want to I want to go to is actually um, very well put. And I want to thank Jay Albanese for asking the question. And I'm going to maybe read a little bit of it at length. And then I'll ask Tyler Walters if he wants to respond. Uh, Jay says, it seems to me that uh, most academics, uh, or at least many academics, are not as well informed about the access crisis as they could be. Um, and I've read where 70% plus of social science journals are owned by just five corporations and hidden behind a paywall. That's true. Uh, consolidation is a big problem in this uh, market. Um, so this works directly against the goal of global access. And uh, in social science, the relevance of social science to applied fields and access to that for practitioners. So to keep one's research open and access in these journals requires exorbitant publication fees. My question. What do you think of so-called diamond journals, which require no fees for authors and are open access to readers? I have published in a couple of them in recent years and found the quality of reviews is the same as other journals, and the timeliness in review to publication is much shorter. But of course, they're new, and they're not yet considered leading journals, um, because academics appear to be led by prestige, i.e. the age of the journal, rather than prioritizing access and dissemination to their work. So um, these diamond journals, the diamond model is really attractive because it's free to authors and free to readers. Um, Tyler, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that free to authors, free to readers model. Yeah, thanks, Brandon, I can. So yeah, there's a lot, that's an excellent question and a lot to unpack there. Um, <clears throat> I guess I would start by saying, you know, open access in its most simplest form is about the scholarship being freely available to readers. So I, I'm, the way I think about this is I kind of decouple that from the business model of how a journal derives revenue to pay for its expenses. And we've seen a very popular model for, especially around STEM journals, is the APC author page charges. 
the uh, diamond or, or platinum, it's also called open access. It doesn't involve that. It's more about sponsorship that's taking care of, uh, of the costs. So I can give you an example. I was involved in a journal uh, that is a, a platinum journal that's about 16 years old now. It's called Information Technology and International Development that's going great guns. And it's uh, now sponsored by the Annenberg School out of the University of Southern California. But it's scholar-led, it's independent. Uh, like I said Annenberg sponsors it now. And it's, it has just been, it's been excellent. It's been online for, I think, all but the first two years of its experience. So I think it's an example of a scholar-led, independent journal, and it's high quality. So the other part of all of this is the peer review system. As, as Jay, as you said, the, uh, the reviews seem to be very good, if anything shorter in time. And the, the business model should be completely separated from the peer review model. Peer review in these kind of journals can be just as robust as any, any journal out there, any, any uh, commercially sponsored uh, scholarly journal. So there's, you know, there's a lot to be said for that. I think uh, people shouldn't shy away from those. The other problem that you're pointing to <clears throat> is kind of this prestige culture that we have as faculty around our scholarly journals. And how do we find which ones seem to be the most valuable? Well, many times it's the list of names and their reputations who are on the, the editorial boards, uh, the length of time something's been out. But I think we need to be putting increasing value on journals that help us, help us meaning universities and our faculty to get new scholarship out there in a broad and fast way. I mean, that's where we have the most impact to society, especially as a, as a public university here at Virginia Tech. We serve the state, we serve the world, and it's about getting new research out there so it has that positive impact. It helps the people who, who need it. Um, that's, you know, that's actually the old cooperative extension service model from, that's still going on today from, from years ago. So we need to question that, that prestige aspect of it. And can we not see that they're perhaps more valuable or at least as valuable is this broad and fast access? Excellent, thanks, Tyler. And so our next question uh, comes from uh, David Burdage. And actually, the, before I get to that question, we had, a, we had someone ask about uh, if there are tweeting rules. And uh, Lisa, I, I follow your tweets of things all the time and uh, the rule is please tweet. Uh, this is a live event open, you know, we're going to make it all publicly available. So um, tweet at your tweet, uh, tweet at will. Um, so the next question uh, from David Burdage, and apologies if I got your name wrong. Um, uh, David asks, part of the problem as I see it is that with the rise of the internet, we've gotten used to and now expect immediate access to anything we want, you know, at no cost. Uh, is it not unreasonable to think that if we adjust our expectations, so that we get what we want or need uh, with perhaps a little delay, a day or so, we can cut costs dramatically with very little real impact on scholarly activity and productivity. Um, and that really goes to a, a, something we were talking about earlier in terms of alternative access and, and you know, uh, timing being in, in fact one of the main things that will change or the only thing that may change. Um, so I wonder, uh, if any of our panelists would want to comment a little bit more and expand on those ideas. Sure, I'll jump in. I just want to say um, thanks, Jay. That's great. Um, it's really nice to know that um, faculty, um, you know, I, I do think that faculty um, understand um, the situation that higher education is in and I would like to see that faculty um, would be willing to wait a day um, or a reasonable amount of time. Um, I, you know, I, I believe in the structures and the systems that we already have in place. I think we're going to, I think we're going to do great. I think we're going to meet your expectations or exceed your expectations if the big deal goes away. So I just want to thank you for asking that question. I, I do think that um, lowering expectations just a little bit um, might really help us, um, but um, I, I think we're gonna, we're gonna surprise you. Absolutely. Would anybody else like to comment on that? 
Well, maybe for, another thing right, so, here okay, is that um, uh, the part of the question about getting access to anything we want at no cost, um, there have been great costs and we have obscured that from our faculty colleagues in trying to make access easy um, for all of you, which is still our goal. But, um, but part of what we're doing here today is sharing with you, you know, the unsustainable burden that those costs have placed and the impact on other parts of the scholarly communication ecosystem by putting too much of our money in one space. Hugely important point. Yeah, what, what we're doing now is, is closing a, a communication loop that has not been closed for a long time and it's so important. Um, you know, when the primary user doesn't know what something costs, it's very hard for them to understand the trade-offs involved and, you know, um, and how the whole system works. Um, so, I have another good, another great question. This one from Richard Poinder. Uh, Richard asks, I am wondering what the implications uh, might be for the ILL system if universities rely on it uh, increasingly, uh, if they unbundle and uh, switch to using things like interlibrary loan as a mode of access. Um, and here, any of our deans could answer. Um, and I also, Nerea, I wonder if you, uh, could, you could expand a little bit on what you've seen in terms of interlibrary loan use since UNC made the changes in its bundle. That might be a place to start. Sure. So we, uh, our deal with Elsevier ended at the end of May. Um, so that's, it's a really short period of time that we have to measure the impact of the unbundling, um, especially with the pandemic sort of on top of that and the change um, in research and teaching. So all of those caveats to say that we haven't seen very much at all of an increase in interlibrary loan. Um, Interlibrary loan has been as steady as it can be. We were closed for a number of months, and so the only interlibrary loan we did was for electronic uh, resources, um, which would include the articles, and we saw that uh, pretty stay pretty steady. Um, and as I indicated before, we did give people options for uh, requesting uh, expedited articles through reprints desk, and those have been very minimal. So I, I, think, I think there are a couple of things happening. One is that the expectation perhaps is right. People are waiting um, and don't need things immediately and regular interlibrary loan works for them quite well. Um, I, I think the other piece of it is that um, we did a very good job in selecting the articles that were needed, in, or the journal titles that were needed immediately. And I say that because we focused in on the clinical titles, which everyone told us they needed to have at hand. And because we did that, I think we took care of a large part of that urgent need. Um, so from our perspective, interlibrary loan uh, works well. Uh, I do have questions around long-term, uh, how well will we do as we all start to unbundle and cancel? Um, how much access will we have? Um, but I think we, it's hard to tell at this point in time. Thanks so much, Norea. Yeah, that, that, that experience um, is consistent with what's been published. You know, lots of libraries have been down this road and there's um, pretty deep research from folks that have been uh, down this road for a few years and they look back and they still see that, you know, if you, as you say, if you choose wisely in the things that you keep the interlibrary loan volume is actually quite modest. Um, and that's just another kind of proof of something that we said earlier in the presentation, which is a lot of the stuff that we're paying for right now, people really don't read that often at all or ever. <laughs> so when we cut those things, uh, they, it turns out nobody comes looking for them because they were never reading them in the first place. Um, so I want to go down to another question. Um, Let's see, we have quite a few good ones. Um, we have another one from uh, Lisa Henschliff about uh, Viva and Wiley. Uh, so Lisa says, Viva had a Wiley agreement that funded open access publishing. Um, uh, and is there a goal uh, to support open access publishing in, uh, in Elsevier journals or other uh, journals? 
or are we focused on cutting the cost of access uh, and and saving saving money? So I wonder if any of the this is a tricky this is a tricky question, but I wonder if anyone in our group wants to um, uh, take a take a shot at this question of you know open access big deals and cost. Brandon, How are we thinking about that in this group? Brandon, uh, yeah, looks like Anne's successfully reconnected. Uh, if she's able to, this would be a good question for her to begin I, addressing. I, I hope you can hear me. Yeah. <laughs> so, victory. Um, well, yeah, I, I think in, in so many ways, open access is a critical, moving that forward is critical to our member libraries, to the consortium. I think finding the right fit for that can be very challenging. We've talked about a variety of ways of doing that in terms of the large publishers getting a, a a really good take on the holistic spend is critical in the read and publish. Uh, I'll, let, I'll let these folks speak to the Elsevier specifically because that's not a big deal. But we also talk a lot about controlling APC costs and, and really containing those. They're, they kind of run rampant at times and there's not a whole lot of transparency. Uh, we also want to have an eye on new models for smaller publishers as well as possible infrastructure. So I think I just want to emphasize there's there's no doubt that open access is key to all of us in moving these things forward, but it's not always with the big publishers that we see it in the same way. And I'd love to have someone here talk about the Elsevier aspect of that. Thanks, Tan. Um, so would any of the deans in the group want to say something about Elsevier in particular? And keeping in mind uh, circumspection at this stage, right? <laughs> but um, but what, what, what can we say about open access in connection with Elsevier in particular? Well, uh, Brandon, I think we can say uh, essentially what um, has been said already, which is uh, we're not in pursuit of a transformative agreement here. We are interested as are uh, the other libraries uh, that have spoken about this process. We're interested in reducing our spend. Thanks, John. Yeah, I think that's, that's a nice, clear way to put it. Um, and so we've got just a few minutes left, but there's a great question that just came in uh, from Anita Waltz at Virginia Tech um, uh, about you know, we could now this is a, you know, we're in a budget crisis and we have to just basically balance our budgets and, and you know, make our way through. But if we have savings, um, I wonder if we can say a little bit about what we would do. I mean, part of our opening argument was things are out of balance in our collection or they will be soon if we don't, if we don't put the brakes on some of these deals. So what will we do if we're able to change the paradigm and we experience some of the savings that we've seen at places like UNC? Who wants to take that one on? Tyler, I see your hand raised. Sure, I can take a stab and hi, Anita. Thanks for being here. Um, you know, what's gonna happen with the funds saved? Well, you know, we, we had some thoughts and ideas, and of course, the, the economic situation we're in now that's pandemic related, the quick answer is going to be whatever savings we get first, it's going to be put toward all of our own budget cuts. I, I think I can speak for the group that, you know, we're all facing some budget cuts and some of the savings will have to be used towards that. The other thing I'd say, keep in mind that, you know, one mode of access we probably will, will use quite regularly is going to be some form of commercial document delivery service, and that does cost, so some money needs to be set aside for that as well. Uh, we could have increased interlibrary loan costs, perhaps, outside of Virginia. Within Virginia, we don't charge one another, as you know, um, but there could be increased costs. So I think those are the some quick things that we would do. We got to, we got to, protect our budgets, we've got to think about how we fund alternate modes of access with that money as well. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Tyler. So we're coming to the last couple of minutes. Um, and I think maybe uh, this would be a good time just to sort of uh, just to sort of summarize where we've been, right. So uh, these seven libraries have been working together uh, now uh, for years and years uh, to strategize uh, to ensure that we're, develop, we're delivering the resources that our scholars need 
uh, in the best way that we can to serve the full diverse range of interests, uh, research interests on our campuses. And uh, uh, we are now, I think, embarking on a little bit of a paradigm shift, and we are not doing it alone. We're part of a global movement, uh, and uh, we're not the first ones to do it. We really appreciate the folks that have walked this path ahead of us. And we also will need your support. And so for all the folks from our campuses who joined this, uh, who joined this event today, uh, we just uh, really wanna ask you to um, think about what you've heard today, talk to your colleagues about it, um, come back and talk to us about any questions you have, um, help us understand the things that you need uh, and, um, and, and just the concerns that you have. And uh, I think all of us are really um, actually excited to have these conversations now about the work that we're doing together and the ways that the world is changing and that we're trying to help change it for the better. Um, so I, I think I will uh, be presumptuous enough to say on behalf of the group, as we come to 11 a.m., um, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, this morning and, uh, and for going with us on this uh, kind of journey. And we look forward to uh, working with you as we make these changes together and to continuing to support research on our campuses. And thank you to the deans. This was a fun conversation. Thanks everybody for, for taking part. And everyone have a lovely Friday. <laughs> <laughs>